The President's letter urging uh, implementation of the 25th Amendment in accordance with its terms and in accordance with the assurance given by num numerous senators and congressmen while it was being considered has been put in the record by the chairman. I have uh, drafted a letter to the president uh, which I will send today and a copy of which I have already delivered to him uh, which I would like to read in reply to his letter. Dear Mr. President, I have your letter of yesterday urging my assistance in expediting the nomination procedures associated with the selection of a new president. Congress has failed to implement and expedite the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, and I regret this very much. Certainly all relevant evidence should be made available, but there is also substantial evidence that Congress has fallen short of its responsibility in expediting these hearings and other actions. In reviewing the legislative history of the 25th Amendment, I have found ample references to the necessity for filling presidential and vice presidential vacancies as quickly as possible. While the Senate floor manager of the amendment, Senator Bayh of Indiana, said he, quote, could foresee the attempt to delay and stall the confirmation, unquote, Senator Sam Irvin responded that patriotic and intelligent members of Congress who love their country, quote, will not jeopardize their country by holding up the consideration of new leaders. In the House of Representatives, then Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Representative Emanuel Sella, who also served as floor manager of the amendment, said, quote, We dare not longer trifle with this situation by neglect. If there is a vacancy, the vacancy must and should be filled, unquote. Congressman John Lindsay noted that a delay in the Senate would put, quote, the monkey on the back of the Congress to do its job. The president does his job in the selection of a proper person to fill the office of the vice presidency. And then Congress must answer to the country if it does not speedily perform its job, unquote. Now, it is my hope that the spirit of the 25th Amendment, displayed in 1965, will be adhered to now as the Congress continues its consideration of a new vice president, sincerely and signed by me. Uh, there have been numerous editorials on this subject, almost unfailingly critical of the delays of the Congress. Uh, we have conducted exhaustive hearings here. Many of the delays are not the fault of the Senate Rules Committee, but the delays incident to securing information from the Joint Committee on Internal Revenue Taxation and from various agencies of the federal government, although the FBI greatly expedited its part of this process. Uh, one of the unfortunate delays occurred when the House Judiciary Committee refused to hold joint hearings with the Senate, and had they done that, uh, perhaps as much as a month or six weeks could have been saved. Without reference to editorials in the rest of the country, let me be parochial enough to quote from those in Philadelphia's, two of Philadelphia's newspapers, the Philadelphia Inquirer of January 10th, uh, November 10th, 1974. Uh, the president really believes that the U.S. needs a vice president and that he should be confirmed as soon as possible, according to Press Secretary Ron Nesson. That is reasonable enough. At the least, Congress should act one way or another, and so forth. There's more quotes in there. And then, to skip a bit, well, it took Mr. Ford 11 days. He became president on August 9th and announced his choice of Mr. Rockefeller on August 20th. That was almost three months ago, and yet Congress still has not said yes or no. So what does that tell us about the decisiveness of the legislative branch? Question mark. It is one thing to be thorough, but it is another to drag out these proceedings for reasons which have nothing to do with Nelson Rockefeller's qualifications. And again, skipping in the interest of brevity, <coughs> the conclusion. We do not doubt that some congressmen and senators are genuinely troubled by disclosures about the gifts 
Mr. Rockefeller has bestowed so lavishly around the political community, among other places. Sooner or later, however, they must decide whether this disqualifies him from the nation's second highest office. Our own view is that nothing, this is the night newspapers, our own view is that nothing which has come to light thus far should bar this strong and distinguished American leader from the vice presidency. The point we want to make here, however, is that Congress should get on with a decision no matter what it is, and it should base that decision on the merits of the nomination instead of extraneous political considerations. After all this time, the legislators can hardly be accused of acting in haste and having watched so many of these same men and women blindly ratify 11th hour vice presidential nominations at political conventions, we view with some skepticism the extravagant caution they now profess. And having participated in a number of those conventions, if I may interject, I can say that a vice president is often chosen the way we come to be born at a time when our progenitors had their minds on quite other matters. To conclude the uh, editorial, further delay would be as unconscionable as it is unnecessary. The hearings in both houses should proceed with dispatch and a vote should be taken well before the Christmas recess. The United States, as Mr. Ford said, needs a vice president now. And then Mr. Robert Roth, of the bulletin on November 5th, 74. Mr. Roth is a respected correspondent who is far more often critical of uh, my party, although he has been critical of both. Uh, but he writes, and I again accept only, President Ford did his part promptly when he became president. He nominated Nelson Rockefeller for the standby post, but Congress has not done its part of the job and obviously is in no hurry to. The justification for this procrastination has been piously pleaded by a member of, number of, it says member of congressmen, who have pointed out that it is their duty to examine with the utmost thoroughness the merits and demerits of a man who might become president, not by popular vote, but by congressional suffrage. They cite the need for meticulous examination of Rockefeller's income tax payments and gifts, and the way he may or may not have used his great wealth to enhance his political power. Those are good justifications up to a point, but they do not alter the fact that Congress could by now have completed its investigations and voted the Rockefeller nomination up or down had it wanted to. It didn't for a number of reasons which had nothing to do with Rockefeller's qualifications or lack of them. And some of these reasons are cited, and I ask unanimous consent to include these two uh, uh, articles in the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, they'll be and made a part of the record. Finally, uh, I met with the president this morning at breakfast, and I learned from him what I have also seen in the press, <clears throat> that the president has the assurances of the Speaker of the House and of Chairman Rodino to press on with these hearings, uh, or let, perhaps I ought to say to begin to press on with these hearings, or to start to begin to press on with these hearings. And I believe there will be a meeting of the House Judiciary Committee on November the 21st. I understand that the Speaker now believes that action uh, on this nomination is possible before Christmas. I sincerely hope so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.